Okay. Hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry if I, I'm not looking at the camera. Most times I would look at the screen, but I will try to look at the camera when I remember. Uh, okay. As Matteo said, we are starting the second part of the course of data mining, the many body quantum problem. Uh, and well, quantum more or less, but let's say many body problem. Um, I'm in charge of the data mining part. So today we are going to talk about machine learning. And in concrete, we are going to do something that is probably what you don't have in mind when thinking about machine learning, but it's unsupervised. in brackets, but we are going to talk about unsupervised machine learning. And before I start talking about that, let's try to have an idea about what is unsupervised machine learning. And for having that idea, we need to start with what is supervised machine learning. In supervised machine learning, you have ideally one input, let's call it X, but it's associated with a response function R, right? And you know everything about that. From these two things, you obtain a model. A model that is nothing else and nothing more than a uh, a functional form and a set of parameters that we will call omega that define the response of the model. So the idea is learn these parameters from this data in such a way that when I apply new data, let's say x prime to this model, I can process and obtain its associated response function. Uh, let's say neural networks, uh, many, many, many supervised machine learning that you listen in nowadays in all the fields of science, are based on this basic idea. And this is, if the model is linear, this is nothing else than a linear regression. If the model is not linear, maybe it's much more complex, but this scheme, this scheme and, uh, still follows, still holds, okay? So, how do you do that? You do that just this process in such a way that let me denote the model as f, that is depending parametrically of these parameters and has x as input. And what we do is to optimize these parameters in such a way that they minimize what is called the loss function. And the loss function, among the loss functions, probably the most common one, is the one defined quadratically. This would be my loss with this data or input data. I optimize my parameters in such a way that the square of the um, 
difference between the real response I may predicted is minimal. Well, that's kind of trivial, but imagine one example that will allow us to talk later about unsupervised machine learning. And the idea is, imagine that you have, let's say, a data set of millions of images of images that have 1,000 times 1,000 pixels of persons, of people. And you want to train a model that may be a neural network to predict the age. In this data set, you have 1,000 by 1,000 is 1 million features, let's say, associated with each data point. And you are reducing all this complexity to a single number. Okay, this is an extremely, extremely important dimensional reduction, right? But one may wonder if this is all the information that is in this data. And the answer is not, of course, because with the same data, with the same um, photos, pictures, one can try to predict, I don't know, for instance, the profession, which is the job. Or you can try to just train your network in order to tell you if the photo is taken outdoor or indoors. So, let me cancel that. What you have is that theoretically, you can try to do infinite classifications infinite kinds of classification from a given data set. But what happens in true is that it's not true. I mean, in reality, this number of possible classifications and many of them, many of them are correlated. Why? No, I don't know. Let's Continuing with the same example of people, if you want to predict the age or you want to predict the hair color, probably both kind of predictions are correlated because many old people have white, uh, white hair, right? It's not that they are uncorrelated. And it's not that they are the same, because for sure there is old people that is, has no uh, white hair, not, and there is young people that do not have any hair. Okay, so at the end, the possible number of classifications independent that can be done from a data set is uh, limited and it's limited and usually it's called d but this small but it's a number that is usually much smaller than you your total number of pixels okay that your total number of features that uh, happens because the correlations 
introduce a structure in your data in such a way that it, it lives in a manifold that is uh, whose dimension is much smaller than the embedding dimension, the dimension of the data by itself. Okay. So you would ask me, and okay, nice, nice introduction, but what has it to do with unsupervised machine learning? Unsupervised machine learning, instead of having a response function, without it, it tries to understand the underlying, um, the underlying structure of your data. And what's this underlying structure? One of the things that we would like to have is a map. It's a map that tells us these 10 to the 6, in this case, features, uh, coordinates, how they map in the manifold, in D. Right? This task it's what is called dimensional reduction. And it's what we are going to do today and, the, and on Wednesday, okay? Also, by itself, knowing this D, it's a task of uh, unsupervised machine learning. But it's called intrinsic dimension. And we are also going to look at that because it's of capital importance for the message in this course. And finally, in what we are also going to explore that is another task that is done with unsupervised machine learning, it's how is the distribution of this data on here. On, so how is the P of X? Because it's not, it may be, and it usually happens, that your data is not uniformly distributed in your manifold. So, uh, to explore how it's distributed, we will use clustering. That it's a way of obtaining the modes, the peaks in your distribution function. Okay. And there are questions. Any question from the audience? I can now. I can read the chat if you prefer to write in the chat or unmute yourself. If there are no questions, I, I will go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, now that I have introduced and supervised machine learning, I will want to explain you what yes, I uh, Sorry, I yes. have a question. Yes. When you say manifold, do you mean it uh, in a geometrical sense, like uh, geometrical manifold, differentiable real? Yes, it's more space. in this sense. Let's okay. say it's, it's the only problem you can think about that in the geometrical sense. But in this case, we are reduced to our sample. We are reduced to our data. We don't have okay. points in the, in the middle. But more or less, the idea is that. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So, as uh, you can, let's say, like it in a like it, like it, it ask why I'm, are we talking about unsupervised machine learning when we were talking about the many body problem, right? And um, I want to put one example coming from physics. Imagine that you have a 
a simulation of atoms in three dimensions, right? And during your simulation, what you do is you solve the questions of motion and at the end test a set of configurations for in which you have the coordinates all the, of the atoms in uh, each, on each configuration are the coordinates of all the atoms. Okay, it's, uh, so each vector that defines a configuration would have three n coordinates, right? In which this n is the total number of atoms, and you have the x, y, theta for each atom, right? So you, we are talking about, imagine that your simulation has 1,000 atoms, that is pretty small. We are talking about a space of 3,000 atoms. Uh, at 3,000 coordinates, sorry. Uh, but let's do it in the much easier way. Let's take S equal to 2. What happens if the, my particles are free? I just need six coordinates, right? X1, Y1, sorry, I will x1, y1, theta1, and x2, y2, theta3. With these six coordinates, I can set perfectly design my configuration. Okay. And these are my two atoms that would have in each configuration the x, y, theta coordinates. Now, imagine that I have a bond, a bond, a rigid bond, let's do it easy, a rigid bond connecting these two atoms. Okay? If I need to define a configuration, the number of coordinates would be the same. However, when I have to compare different configurations, the rigid bond will change the structure of the manifold that I'm uh, sampling because these atoms cannot be farther than this distance, okay? This is just putting a rigid bond between two atoms. But, okay, now imagine that you are a computer. If you are a computer, is there a way in which if I give you the set of configurations, n configurations of a free, two atoms that are free in the space, or the same number of configurations, but of two atoms that are not free, but are bonded in the space, can I distinguish them? Well, as chemist, I can tell you, yes. Uh, you can have, instead of using x, y, theta, you can change your coordinates and say, okay, I'm going to use the x, y, theta of the center of mass and then my distance between the two atoms and the, let's say, let's try to define the two angles that define the position in this sphere. Okay. Let's call it omega. Okay. These are two angles, whatever. It's not important. What is important is that if I do this transformation, what I would obtain is a big difference between the, my simulation in which the both atoms are free 
So all these coordinates would be important when I compare a pair of configurations and my simulation in which this bond is frozen. Because if this bond is frozen, this F12 would be equal to for all my configurations, right? So by introducing this correlation that is a frozen bond, I change the space of, of the configuration. I change the manifold of my that is explored by my configuration. Okay. So by changing that, uh, my manifold, I mean, if I take a look to the configurations in these coordinates, I would immediately realize that this thing is not changing. So it would tell me something about the physics of the system. Right? Okay, that's something that I can do it in this really easy case because I know it. I know what's going on. I know the constraint that I put in my simulation. I know everything. Alex, but tell me. There is a question in the chat. Uh, okay. I think it's the one that I already replaced. Okay. Me for the space. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, thank you, Matteo. Um, so, the idea is that, okay, in this case, that is a physical case, I can do this dimensional reduction. I can pass from D6 to 5, because I can ignore that, just because I know that I fix this bond length. What happens? What happens when you don't know it? What happens if I just gave you these coordinates for both simulations and you have to understand what's going on? So in these cases, in, it's when you can go to unsupervised machine learning, dimensional reduction, and try to figure out what's going on. Okay? And try to, your computer, figure out what's going on. One thing that usually happens is that this bond is not fixed, but it's constrained by a kind of let's say, elastic constant, really uh, quadratic potential. So what you would obtain if you plot, let's say, this coordinate, or this R12 as function of any of the other coordinates, but let's put the x of the center of mass, you would obtain that your point do something like that. So the constrained variable, the variable that is less important because it's almost fixed, would have a really low variance if you compare with the other variables. Okay, the variance of L12 would be something like here, while the other variance would be big. Okay. Uh, that's important because this idea is the one that we are going to use for uh, the first method that I'm going to explain you, that is principal component analysis. Okay. But, okay, before going to principal component analysis, I think we can stop for a small uh, question. Uh, professor, yes. Uh, in this case, if we consider that you have one particle, and we can easily follow the particle in the space, yes. That means at each time we we can take the position of the particle. Yes. If Please. we consider that we have two particles in this case, and those are entangled, that means they are connected. Yes. Uh, 
you can you can think about two independent simulations. In one, they are independent, and the, in the other one, they are connected. Okay, this means every time we try to to check the position of those particles. Yeah. Uh, here, what is the place of machine learning in this case? What are we using machine learning? Oh, the question is that now we are still not using that. In this case, we use it. We use human learning, let's say, just to change to do a, a projection of our x y theta of both atoms in a coordinate system that allows me, allows me to identify that there is one coordinate that is not changing. Okay? But that's something that I did by myself. I did it by myself because I know that in this system I have two atoms and I have a bond, so I, my change of coordinates is guided by my knowledge, right? But what happened? What would happen if I didn't knew it? What would happen? Uh, what would happen if I? Yes, uh, I see the other question in the other questions in the chat. But let me finish that. The question is that if I had just x y theta x y theta for both simulations. What would be just columns of numbers from which myself, I can look at them and I would not understand if there is a difference between both simulations. I understand the difference once I did this change of coordinates, but it's just a change of coordinates. Do not care about the details. I just did a change of coordinates that allowed me to see that this bond is fixed or it, it's constrained in this case. Okay. It's much clearer now. Yes, a, a little bit. It means we are, we are just we are looking for the coordinate if we have some coordinate uh, which are not changing in the system. Yes, that's what we are looking for. Okay, thank you. Okay. Excuse me, may I also ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, does it mean that if we do not fix a parameter, uh, we cannot use unsupervised learning? No, it doesn't. Uh, the question is that till now, I use my knowledge to understand what is going on. But I didn't use any technique of unsupervised machine learning yet. I just use human learning to you to perform a dimensional reduction, right? I just knew that there was a bond and then I changed my dimensions in such a way that one of them can be ignored. Because I don't, in my configurations, when I would compare two configurations, in the case that this bond is fixed, I can ignore that bond because it would be the same in all the configurations, right? Thank you, sir. So it's not that uh, we are still not using unsupervised machine learning. I'm just using my learning to understand the physics. And the idea is that make you understand that this dimensional reduction that I did with my knowledge can be done automatically by your, by the computer. I get it now, thanks. Okay. Uh, let me read the questions in the... Okay. Paolo Marsicovertere. Uh, sorry, could you repeat what was the importance of transforming the feature space? Well, in the case, in this case, it allows us to distinguish between a simulation in which there is a bond between both atoms and a simulation in which this bond was not existing. Because in by this transformation of the space, by transforming the space in this way, 
I can see that this variable was not, uh, it's not varying in different configurations, or by the contrary, in the case that there is no bond, this variable will change like the other ones. Okay. This is from physics why we are using dimensional reduction in this case. But I did dimensional reduction just by, by hand, let's say. I did it by myself. Okay, Alejandro, there are uh, all the questions regarding the um, these coordinates. It's not true that the, the okay. This is not the only change of coordinates that I can do. I choose that because it was a very well suited for explaining this this case, but. Whatever, uh, the idea is that if you change your coordinates in such a way that you see some invariances, these invariances are usually induced by the correlations in, in this case among your particles, right? Among your coordinates. So that's. Uh, thanks. Uh, Okay, Singara uh, Velan, and it's not true that the feature space is linear in general. In the case that we are going to explore today, it is. Okay, so let me continue. And the idea of the method that I'm going to explain to you now is to arrive to a situation like this one, in which I have a coordinate whose variance is much lower than the other ones. Okay. One coordinate or several coordinates. I would transform my space in order that I can have a new set of coordinates in which the variance of some of them is maximized. And the other ones that I would ignore, it's minimized. Okay, this is what is fundamentally done by PCA. Okay, that is principal component analysis. Okay. So before I start doing that, let me just assume some things of the of notation because it's a bit mathy. Okay. The first thing is that we can assume that all the vectors are centered. So imagine that I have for each uh, this for each configuration. It means okay for each configuration I have I I have a vector of features right in which each of them would be which one I. Till my total number of coordinates. Okay. By center, what I mean is that the sum of all these for a given k is equal to zero. Okay. I can do that without loss of generality because I can just transform my data in such a way that once I have it, I can do this sum and subtract it, right? So I can subtract the average, the average. I can subtract that from each coordinate. And in this way, my data is centered. I'm doing that just because um, 
it allows me to perform a bit math, the math a bit easier, okay? But just having that in mind. Excuse me, Professor. Yes. The, sum, the sum is over i. It, the sum is over i, yes. It's for all the configurations. I mean, oh, for okay. each point of the, for uh, each of the features are centered. Okay. It's not that the ve this vector is centered in itself. It's the center for all the, the data that you sample. Hello, please, could you repeat the last part? Okay. Thank you. This part, the centering. The idea is that you have n configurations, let's say, that I will denote by the index i, okay? Each of them, each of them is defined by a vector of x in which you have d dimensions, okay? The idea is that each of these dimensions is centered. It means that for doing that, you have to do something like that. It's I K in the center. Let's put it like that. It's equal to X I K minus one divided by N, the sum for all the I. Okay? In this way, the average value of each of these coordinates would be zero, right? Clear? Because I'm just subtracting that to all the, your, all the data. Okay. So, once we have our data center, What I can say is, okay, let's do one and some and such. I, my and such is that my new coordinates, let me cancel also here, that I would denote as y, i, would be a linear transformation. of my previous one. Okay. Okay. This is just saying that I would have a new set of coordinates, each of its components, that would be a vector y of i, each of its components is a linear transformation, a linear combination of all the other components in the other space. Okay? This is not true in general, but I'm doing this assumption. Okay. So the idea is, as I told you before, it's to find this transformation in such a way that the variance in the transform space is maximal. Okay. Because I just want to have coordinates, my new set of coordinates, in such a way that they have a huge variance, a big variance. Because I don't want the ones with the small variance. As the, in the transformation before, when I transform my coordinates from the Cartesian XYZ of each atom to 
the Cartesians of the center of mass and all that stuff. What I say is, okay, to describe a configuration, I would ignore the distance between the two atoms because it's almost constant, right? It has a really low variance. So what I would do is to transform my data, my previous data, in a new one in such a way that I maximize the variance. Okay? Let's take to do it in one really easy case. And then I will try to explain if we have time the match. But let's start doing it in a really easy case. I don't think if we are going to have time. But. Imagine that you have in two dimensions. This set of points. Okay. In these two dimensions, let's call it x1 and x2. Of course, you can see that the variance is the same, in almost the same in both cases. Right? So, what I plan to do, what I want to do is to obtain a new set of coordinates that tell me. This is one coordinate, and this one is the other one, okay? And I will retain only the coordinate that has a big variance. And I would ignore that, doing a small error, okay? This is a way of doing dimensional reduction with PCA. Okay. Uh, is it similar to the clustering method? To the clustering method. Clustering. Yeah. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Because in clustering, what we are trying to do is imagine that you have these two point distributions. You want to have something like that, right? While here we are just trying to know which coordinates are important for describing our system. Okay? Okay. It's a bit different. Uh, so, uh, we will see clustering in the next lectures. Uh, so but tell me. Here we are already have uh, many positions for the particle. Uh, uh, According to the to the graph you plot, um, the yes, no, we have yes. Those those are not even particles. Those are those are two features describing your data, your configurations. Okay, and the the, the dot are the particle or the position. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's just forget about the physics. Okay. For a while, it's just they are just features in the space. Okay, they may be, I don't know, you can, whatever transformation of coordinates that you can think about. But in this case, you have two. But in general, for instance, in the case of icing that was explained by Marcello, uh, you have, if you have an icing 2D, you will have something like the number of spins in your system. As coordinates, right? Yes. So in this case, I'm simplifying that to two because it's the way that we can draw it. Okay? Okay. But the, the ideas are the same. Now I'm doing it in two dimensions, but uh, the ideas are applicable to many dimensional uh, cases. Indeed, it's when well, it's interesting. Here, the question, my problem is that I cannot draw in 100 dimensions. So I'm trying to explain the concept in the easiest way that it's just with two dimensions. Okay, okay. thank you. So, more questions? Yes, I have one question. Okay. 
Uh, you said that the uh, variance mm -hmm. have to be large. I, yeah. Is it part of the method or there is some uh, specific yeah, reason is, for that? I, I'm going to explain to you now the method, but the idea is that what I would do is to perform a rotation of the space of my, a rotation of my vectors, my, let's say, my basis in such a way that I can orient this is your original basis, right? X1, X, X2. If you perform a rotation of this in such a way that now you have this basis, let me write it with a different color in such a way that it's clear. Now you would have I1, I2, Your data is equivalent, right? You are just rotating your, your basis. But in this new basis, the variance along one of the components is maximal. Okay? So by maximizing in this way the, the, the variance, what you can do is saying, okay, now in two dimensions, it's not so meaningful, but what you can do is saying, okay, I'm projecting all my points that they were in two dimensions in just one. In, in which one? In the one that have a big variance. So I would plot all my points in this dimension. So I pass from two dimensions to one with minimum information loss. Okay, because I'm losing just this thing, this is small variance coordinate, right? Yes, okay, thank you. I can do it in two dimensions. Sir. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, okay. I, don't, I don't know, maybe the example is a little bit misleading for me, but uh, what if the data is distributed in some peculiar way? like uh, three different clusters or okay, in, that, in, this, in this way, I don't uh, see how okay. we can give the sense to... Uh... If they are two clusters, there is not a big issue because maybe, I mean, there is nothing against having this, the data like that, right? The problem came, and I want to explain it to you later, if we have time, when uh, the transformation of the data is not linear. I'm, okay, you, you are right. The method, if the data is not distributed linearly, let's say in an hyper plane, in the case, let's say it's correctly, mm -hmm. the method will not work properly. Okay. But it's important to know this method because it's at the basis on, of all the dimensional reduction methods. Okay, so uh, this is why I want to explain you this method today. And then we will see the problems that it has and all that stuff. Okay, thank you. Welcome. More questions? No, if there are no more questions, let's say to do it in this case, okay. In this case, if you compute the covariance matrix, how do you compute the covariance matrix? Since it's centered, it would be the covariance between two variables, LK, would be this. The sum for all your points of the product, right? Because I already centered. So this is the covariance. Yes? So once you have the covariance, uh, when uh, I miss, uh, I will have to take the average. This is the covariance. Let's compute the covariance for this point, or let's assume that it's something like that. It's a matrix, which I have one, 
1.0.9 Let's use these numbers that I put in an example that I have here. Okay. You can easily diagonalize that, right? So if you diagonalize that, what you obtain are since it's symmetric, you will obtain two real values. One of them is 1.89. And the other one is. And you will obtain also two eigenvectors. Okay? An eigenvector associated to one. That would be uh, and a second engine vector that would be the opposite. By obtaining these two values, two agent vectors, agent values, agent vectors, what you do is this corresponds to this variance. This one corresponds to this one. And the agent vectors correspond to the, your new space. Okay? So, you can, from that, easily obtain your transformation Let's say, once you have that, you say, okay, this variable, how much of my global variance explains, and it came by lambda 1 divided by lambda 1 plus lambda 2. Okay, this is what, let's call it the fidelity. of my dimensional reduction. In this case, I'm performing an extreme dimensional reduction. I'm going from two to one coordinate. And I'm saying that my new coordinate would be expressed in this basis. And it explains 1.89 over let's say, two of my global variance, so it's a really good coordinate, okay? I'm, I'm losing a bit of information, but the amount of info that I'm losing, it's really, really low. It's, let's say, my data will fit really well in a line, okay? So, once I have that, this is a diagonalization. Once I have that, I can easily project my data in my new agent vector just by taking that. And let me cancel here. That my i, let's say i, would be equal to. A11, that would be minus 0.7. Uh, oops, sorry, it's, it's something I, here it should be positive. Okay. 0.7 times the value of each one plus 0.7 the time of each two. Okay. Just by taking this, let's say this is my transformation. The formula that I would use to obtain from these coordinates a single coordinate. Okay. What I did here for an easy case in two dimensions can be generalized to 
many dimensions. Okay? And I will write you the formula. I will not derive it because we don't have time. But I will write you the formulas here and then next day we will continue. Okay? What we do is to compute the covariance matrix. That is symmetric. Once I have that, I diagonalize it. With this diagonal matrix, I will obtain an spectrum of D eigenvalues, right? I will retain the D small, more important, bigger, in such a way that the fidelity would be the sum of sorted eigenvalues from I to D small divided by the same but with all the eigenvalues. Okay? So when I pass from with PCA from one space to the other, I have to compute this number in such a way that I have an idea of the total amount of variance that is preserved by my projection. Okay? And I think I will stop here. Uh, on Wednesday, I will continue explaining you the PCA. Uh, we will finish with that. But uh, I want to know if there are questions. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, I had a question which might sound a little bit silly because the whole machine learning thing is very new for me, but mm -hmm. I would appreciate it if you answer it. And uh, my question is that, uh, does it mean that in unsupervised learning, the classification that we do over the whole data uh, is like uh, uh, the different clusters are not completely independent? Does it mean that they are somehow related to each, each other in unsupervised learning? Okay, this, let's say, um, today we didn't perform, say, a single word about clustering. I'm just talking about how to transform the coordinates, okay, in the space from a uh, original space to another one of lower dimension. Okay, clustering. We will see that in following lectures. No, you know my my main question is about the difference between the supervised and unsupervised learning okay. techniques. In okay. super, the, the idea is in supervised uh, learning, you have a ground truth. Okay. We have you what? Have, sorry, we have what? A ground truth. You, uh -huh. you know something about your data. You know you have a response function that it came along your data that allows you to train your model. So it doesn't mean that uh, we only do the linear regression for the supervised learning. We can also no. do that in unsupervised also. Yes, I mean, the idea is that for linear regression, it's a case of supervised learning because okay. you have uh, some data and a response function, right? Uh -huh. You have an x, y, right? Yes. In, this case, you, in the case of unsupervised learning, you just have your data. You don't have any response function. So we have to okay. set some criteria ourselves and test Imagine them with Let me finish. Imagine yes, that sir. you have, uh, let's say, 
a configuration of atoms in the space, and you have energies associated. Okay? Supervised learning would be would take all the configurations and all the energies, and if you gave a new configuration, it would allow you to predict the energy, right? Okay. This is supervised, because okay. I have a response function. In a supervised, I would not have the energies. I would make groups or try to understand the structure just of the data space. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, in this uh, last case, uh, in which we went to general uh, dimension D, uh, do we project on a hi hi hyperplane? Yes, we're trying to, you are doing a transformation in an hyperplane. I mean, let's say you can do it, apply it to whatever data you want, but it's only correct if you're it's strictly correct if your data lies in a in a hyperplane. plane. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, when when you talked about the the small the, the eigenvalues, uh, are bigger compared to what? Uh, in the in you you sort them from the biggest one to the smaller one. Yeah, but then you it's like you specify the sum so what are the how many eigenvalues we take you for okay this is something that we are going to discuss discuss next day because today ah, okay okay we don't have time thank you welcome uh and there are questions in the chat asking about references for the lecture okay uh i didn't get any reference as i told you as we told you we are we are going to give you the latex, le uh, latex notes for this lecture. Um, I can, I would put a reference in the matrix, in the elements, okay? I didn't get it today with me, but I will give it to you. And if that's all, I think we can stop here. And see you on Wednesday. Okay, uh, I would give uh, Fabio re re finishing your your replay. I will get, give you the reference next day. Okay, on Wednesday. Matteo, I think we can stop recording. Uh, Sarah, for what? What link? Ah, okay, I don't have it here. Uh, uh, please ask, uh, ask Matteo in, in any case. Uh, Matteo, could you please uh, put the link of the matrix here? Okay. I already uh, put it. Okay. So, Matteo, I think we can stop recording and...